and we get started. Uh, good morning, everyone. Today we have Professor Shilling Shen, who will be the speaker for the Terzaki Seminar Series. He is currently the professor and the chief scientific officer at the Terzaki Institute for Biomedical Innovation. He is also chief executive officer of Silas Inc. He was formerly the Hawkins Family Associate Professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Duke University. He was also the director of the Wolf Center for Big Data and Precision Health. He has received all of his degrees, BSMS, PhD from Stanford, also won an NSF Career Award while he was at Cornell University. He was the steering committee chair of the NCI Patient Drive Model of Cancer Consortium, co-chair of the NCI Tissue Engineering Consortium, cancer track chair of Biomedical Engineering Society 2019. His lab works on precision medicine from a system biology perspective. The floor is yours, Shilling. Oh, great. Thank you, Mehmet, for the, for the introduction. And uh, again, really, pretty, uh, really I'm pleased to uh, talk to this audience again. I gave a presentation, uh, I think, a little while ago, but this time, kind of really kind of uh, going a little deeper on a technology my lab uh, invented, which is called a microorganospheres and really kind of showing its promise for precision oncology. And uh, also for the audience who uh, don't know about me, uh, based on a uh, full disclosure, based on this technology, I uh, founded a company um, and had a uh, $89 million raise, a series A raise uh, on this technology to really bring it to the clinic. Uh, with that, I just kind of want to uh, talk about, right, what is the problem facing cancer care right now? If a patient has a primary tumor that can be resected, you know, great, the patient has great uh, prospect for recovering and disease free. But if the patient has metastatic or uh, disseminated tumors, then you, you can uh, have a surgery to, to cut it out and the patient has to undergo uh, treatment such as chemo, radiation, and uh, immune oncology, immune therapy, immunotherapy. So these are typical scenario when a patient was diagnosed, diagnosed with an inoperable cancer, um, so the patient going to undergo is called a stand of care therapy. So there's a uh, guideline and CCM guidelines on what drug to, to, to give, usually the first line, the second line, the third line. And based on the cancer types, usually in the first line, the response rate means the drug does anything on the tumor, even just to kind of you know, stop its growth. Um, the response rate range from 20 to 40%. And when we move on to the second line, the third line, it drops from you know, 20 to 10 and below 10%. And usually after several lines, the patient are kind of becoming uh, significantly weaker and they e either get sent to the hospice and kind of wait out their time, or they can try to sign up for clinical trials if they are still strong enough. But historically, the patient, the chance that the patient respond to a, to a drug in the clinic, in a clinical trial is about five to, five to 8%. So if you look at this whole picture, Right. Um, what strikes you is most of our patients are receiving a treatment that would not have any efficacy against the tumor, but at the same time, the patient suffers toxicity and also financial toxicity. Right, uh, these drugs are very expensive. You know, after health health insurance, and also they are losing very precious time. Right, if they have the right treatment on the first line, um, they probably are going to have a much better chance um, of extending their survival significantly when they're still are strong and have a functional immune system. So, you know, the, the, the whole field was, right, we all had, um, um, uh, back then, you know, in the last 20 years, we are thinking that this genomics is gonna, uh, sequencing is gonna solve the problem because if you know the tumor mutation, you can find the right drug and then you can treat the patient uh, the right way. However, the truth is still right now below 10%, of the patients actually benefit from uh, the, the, the sequencing um, uh, based approach. The reason is because most of the times the patient do not have a mutation that's directly targetable. So they go on to have the standard of care. And right now um, uh, for, for, the, for, the, for the sequencing, it doesn't really predict if a patient, how the patient will respond to chemotherapy and oftentimes to you know, immune therapy or radiation therapy. So what about this 93% of patients right now uh, who are not, you know, kind of guided by uh, quote unquote precision medicine really based on, you know, sequencing? Um, as, as my mother mentioned, right, I was chairing some of the, 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 the consortium and the CI 
which has been really funding a very concerted effort to say, you know, can we build a patient-derived models that can actually predict how a patient respond to the treatment? And again, of course, it's an international effort, not just you know MCI. Um, but here you can see that there's right a whole slew of very high impact papers in top journals, again, again, sending a message saying, look, uh, organoids, right? 3D, uh, basically patient-derived organoids. These are 3D cultures of tumors. They have a pretty high concordance with uh, a patient's clinical outcome, right? The numbers, you know, cited somewhere here, you know, you're, you're looking at 80 to 90%, right? Kind of, you know, predicted value. Um, and that's pretty high versus, you know, 20, 30% response rate. So the question is, you know, in the last five years, right, researchers, clinicians are like being constantly asked why, why these technologies are not helping pay, pay, pay patients in the clinic right now, right? What's preventing that? And this is an example of one of the right, leader, Hans Klevers, who invented the organoids. And, and by his, his kind of uh, recent data, uh, 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 clinical trials uh, and Netherlands and Europe, in Europe actually overall kind of you know, really, really show the missing pieces, right? When he ran a trial, each one cost, you know, a lot more, uh, more than $3,000 uh, per patient. It takes two to three months to establish enough um, organoid cell mass for the required drug testing with enough dosage and the replicates. And you know, as, as many of you know, right, the patients usually get put on treatment within 14 days. So two to three months are too long. No patients are willing to wait that long. And also, you know, from a biopsy, the success rate is you know, um, below um, 40%. So now you're asking potentially a patient to wait for two to three months and then telling them that their, um, their organoid did not establish, right? So they just wasted two to three months. And the last is the lack of automation and standardization because when you when you know if you have different clinic a different laboratory do this study and now still the it's a very manual process and it relies on the individual operator skill so 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 you can imagine that this could never pass the FDA right approval process if if you don't have the level of uh, reproducibility required um, for for using that as a commercial asset in the clinic so these are all the challenges. And also, as Mahmoud mentioned, right, um, while, while I kind of, you know, was a part of um, and also, you know, was a chair for the patient derived model of cancer consortium and also um, the cancer tissue engineering Collab 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 collaborative where Ali was on, um, it's again the same idea, right? The technology really have a lot of promise, but a universal challenge to predict patient uh, clinical outcome is you get a very limited clinical samples um, that, and these cells are very slow growing and oftentimes they completely stop growing after two to three passages. And so you have very small amount of material to work with. And uh, these, cell, these tumors are heterogeneous, have many different cell types and have many different clones, different clones like uh, 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 tumor clone cells with different mutations. And last is um, while we're passaging those tumor cells, we lost, we lose the microenvironment, including stromal and immune cells and endothelial cells. So you're losing a big part of biology. And the question is how predictive model that is, especially for more, more sophisticated treatments such as immunotherapy, which relies on the immune cells to do most of the work. So while thinking about this problem, I want to draw an analogy of the right the, the big innovations in the past. Uh, half a century. So I was trained as an electrical uh, engineer. As my, my side, I got all my degrees at Stanford actually as an electrical engineer. I was a circuit designer. And right, what, what, what kind of what happened that what feel the uh, IT revolution uh, or the digital revolution in the past half a century is this Moore's law, right, where the device or, or each transistor, uh, its performance and its size gets shrinked uh, twice. Um, every 18 months, right? So this gave rise to from 1960s, these vacuum tubes, right? If some of you are old enough to remember radios made up three vacuum tubes and two, right? Nowadays, the integrated IC or integrated circuits where you have millions of transistors um, on the chip. Uh, that's, feel, that's kind of power our laptop, our cell phones, right? GPS and everything. 
and even our cars nowadays. If you, the, the last you know, 20 years, the similar revolution happened with sequencing. I right? started from early day Sanger sequencing, which is this bulk measurements are very slow. And if some of you remember that first human genome projects, right, take, take, take a decade and billions of dollars to sequence. And now with the next generation sequencing, similar idea, right? Each, each reaction, you make it much smaller and you, we are we, we, you know, imaging every individual reaction so that you can image millions of reactions uh, at the same time and drastically speed up um, the, the sequencing while have much higher accuracy and higher signal to noise ratio. So when Hans invented organ noise in 2009, it kind of struck me that uh, this parallel, right? That can we shrink the functional assay making, you know, these you know, assays on the live cells also much smaller and faster and a higher throughput and also much cheaper per reaction so that we can uh, truly um, you know, bring it to the clinic and commercialize this technology. So here kind of the, the, um, the technology has been published uh, at a, this is a cover, a cover story at this, the, the past June issue of Cell Stem Cells. So again, more than welcome to uh, you know, read the paper and, and kind of below is this, the highlights, right? So we, again, really kind of be able to invent a new technology called microorganospheres or MOS that allow us to really overcome the challenges I mentioned uh, previously, which is the speed, the tumor microenvironment, the heterogeneity, and also for the immune therapy. And furthermore, um, I think actually this, uh, this technology was highlighted by the National Cancer Institute and the MCI actually kind of highlight our technology to all its subscribers. So what is it, right? So here I just kind of give you a very uh, intuitive kind of in the direct view of what these moss look like. So on the bottom is the time when we get this biopsy. So this is a liver cancer um, hepatocarcinoma, uh, but, uh, 18 gauge biopsy. We record, we, when we got a, got a biopsy, right, um, and generating this MOS, which is a, took about half an hour, so it's very quick. But uh, but then from the zero day, right, zero hour, that's what it looks like. These two, basically, the cells in, in this tumor are encapsulated in this um, micro micro gel beads called a MOS, which is about 250 microns. And then you can see, right, over you know one day and two day, how fast these tumor spheres form inside these moss, and by day three, they are already ready for drug dosing. So in this case, in day seven, we can already finish drug dosing and see how these patient tumor respond to the drug treatment. But also very importantly, uh, during that whole process, the entire uh, the tumor microenvironment, all the stroke cells, immuno, immune cells are still present inside the moss. As you can see here, PEN-CK labels the tumor cells, CD3 labels the uh, the, the, the T cells um, and uh, lymphoids and, uh, at least, uh, and the CD56 labels the natural killer cells. So you can see that the different immune cells are still present inside the mouse. And this is kind of done by these uh, uh, device. Now we have a 4.0 um, device and our, our 5.0 device is, is gonna eliminate all the, all the tubes. And so this is a highly automated process. So you might well ask, why does it matter? Right? What's, what is the benefit for mini miniaturizing these tumors? And how does that help us overcome the challenges I mentioned? Uh, so here's an example from that patient biopsies. If, uh, if, you, if, if we measure these, uh, the, the response of that patient tumor to the drugs, and let's say you here you put into three wells, right? you have your three um, uh, repeats, and what happened is from to wall to wall, because the cell, the cell volume is very low, so you have very few cells per well, and it's heterogeneous, right? So there's um, variation from wall to wall. The variation, variation is so big that you cannot really read uh, whether the tumor is going to respond to the drug. So basically, the noise levels are too high. The noise variation is overwhelming the actual signal. And you can appreciate why. So, so this signal actually is measured. So these are cell type of glow, right? Uh, luminescence measurements from um, these moss in the well. So here we are already putting exactly 50 moss per well, but you can appreciate that, right? These patient, uh, patient tumors 
don't grow as you, what you do with the cell lines in the lab, right? These are heterogeneous uh, tumors that you can appreciate from mouse to mouse, you know, each, you know, this very faint circle is a mouse, but the tumor sphere is growing. You can appreciate, right? Some of them grow very big, while some of them are very small, right? So there's a tremendous heterogeneity in terms of growth, just even within, uh, from the same patient or within the same well, and no wonder, right? From well to well, you're gonna get uh, this variation unless you have put a lot of cells per well. Now, what, what advantage of the MOS is now, uh, first is we are able to using AL algorithm to distinguish these tumor spheres, right? Which made many of tumor cells from the stromal cells, which does not form these spheres so that we can actually distinguish the tumor cell response from the non-tumor cell response, kind of to really address that heterogeneity uh, challenge. And second is that because all these models sitting on the same plane, it makes the imaging a lot easier. So we can do imaging, you know, on the same focal plane, it basically captures every single tumor spheres, not like the traditional uh, bulk organoids where you have to take many stacks to capture, right, uh, the, the tumors, the tumor spheres organized in a 3D structure. And so, so this really, and, and third is because we're measuring every single tumor spheres and every tumor sphere inside the mouse give us a, a separate data point. So now well to well variation become irrelevant because 50 mouse actually gave us 50 data points, right? Rather than one data points from the traditional bulk measurement. And again, the analogy that's exactly the same power that when we're doing next generation sequencing. Right from Sanger sequencing, it's the same idea. You are, in, you are, you are collecting individual data points. So what this gave us is much higher statistical power. On the bottom, you can see on the left when we increasing the drug dosages, these tumor spheres, right, the viability of these tumor spheres, as shown by the ratio of the live label versus death label, uh, decreases and they move down the axis, and mean, meaning they're getting killed by the drug. And furthermore. You can appreciate the size of each tumor sphere is also getting smaller because they're getting killed. On the right is a drug that doesn't kill, doesn't have a cytotoxic effect to the tumor sphere. So you can see that still they are largely, you know, stay with the similar viability. And the exact same, right, the same sample, but actually the exact same well, what we did is we did this image analysis, then did a cell type glow, right, from the same well. And you can appreciate that when we having using the, the, the power of numbers and and, and quantify every single individual tumor spheres, you get a much more robust readout. Like right? clearly the tumor actually respond to the first drug, which is genocidabine, but resistant to the second, uh, more resistant to the second drug. While comparing to the, right, the cell type of glow as it measured from cell the same well, you can appreciate, right, the, the difference in the robustness of the readout. And that's the very fundamental principle, right, engineering principle. If you think about when increasing the number of reads, your signal, uh, scale uh, with the number of n and your noise scale with the number of square root of n, so you are getting much higher signal to noise ratio. And furthermore, this technology allows you to discern different drug mechanistics. So in this case, right, these are the you know, these are the controlled untreated tumor. So green is a live, live dye. This is showing the live cells. On the on the middle is a, a EGFR inhibitor, ERLO. Um, and what you see is the tumor sphere is getting smaller but the cells are still largely alive, right? So these drugs block uh, inhibitor growth, but don't really have a cytotoxic effect to kill the cells. Well, on the right, SN38, which is metabolized form of a renal TCAM, the cells are actually color change, the tumor spheres color change, because they're getting killed. So using this technology, you can discern not just, oh, the drug is reducing the tumor volume, but is the drug has a cytotoxic effect or it's a cytostatic effect. And furthermore, the technology also making it's very simple to isolate uh, resistant clones. In this case, you can see that when we did drug treatment, uh, right, it's killing most of the tumor spheres, but this, there's a clearly a resistant clone that stand out that it will be easy to, uh, set, uh, uh, easy to isolate using our mouse, because it's, it's, it's in a standalone mouse. So this really allows us to have the technology to also predict what resistant clone might emerge and what would be the second line therapy might be, or even more, if you want to treat it more aggressively, having a combination, right, that targeting the resistant clone uh, at the same time uh, as the as the as the first drug. Another another tech, uh, another advantage of the mouse is now we can evaluate the genomic gene uh, genomic genomic editing. So in this case, you can see 
um, you know, there's there's a KRAS G12B uh, tumor, and we also uh, reverted back to a wild type tumor. And you can see that when we reverted back to the wild type, uh, you can first appreciate the difference in morphology. Uh, but the nice thing is, right, these tumor have exactly the same uh, background, genetic background. The only difference is that driver mutation. That gives you a very clear, uh, a very clean isogenic control to understand the drug effects. In this case, you can see that when we convert to wild type, the tumor becomes sensitized to an EGFR inhibitor. And when we mutate on 43, it uh, sensitized to porcupine inhibitor. And furthermore, another thing is the tumor, um, right, the, 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 the moss with the major gel and, you know, it, uh, it's, uh, people always assume it uh, works for the solid tumor. And uh, yeah, yes, it does work for the solid tumors. But another thing we found out is also it really has a very unique application for a lot of liquid tumors because a lot of the liquid tumors such as, you know, lymphomas, multiple myelomas, uh, these tumors, uh, this liquid tumor actually still require a niche to grow, usually the bone marrow niche. So oftentimes these, uh, these two liquid tumors are actually very difficult to culture uh, um, in, the, in the lab. From the multiple myeloma, all we have is three cell lines and, uh, and, um, and, and, you know, and, and very difficult to grow those models. And here with the moss, um, what we able to show is that really that the moss also recapitulate the, the bone marrow niche and also the stromal environment, which is essential for these multiple myeloma cells to grow. And that explains why it's so difficult to derive uh, those cell lines. And again, using this technology, we're also able to, again, right in the lab, assess how the, how the patient tumor is gonna respond to different drugs and kind of basically you know, looking at what drugs might work on, on, on those patient tumors. So, one unique feature of this mouse, as I mentioned, right? First is because we do mouse, we get a much higher signal to noise ratio for us to evaluate drugs such as chemotherapy and targeted therapy and the radiation therapy. The second is, of course, a holy grail is that can we have a patient-derived model that can be used to assess immunotherapy? The challenge of immunotherapy is that right, it requires the immune cells from the tumor environment and even from the um, from the system, system circulation to come in and uh, come by the tumor. And it's very, the response very subject to the tumor microenvironment. If the microenvironment is immunosuppressive, right, the T cell will be prevented from attacking those tumors. So, but right now we don't really have a model that can recapitulate that. Right now in the lab, we have people often doing, right, putting some cancer cell lines, then putting some you know, uh, uh, T cells or patient drug or, or patient blood cells, PDMCs, right? Um, to do a cold culture assay, they are oftentimes allogeneic, means the, 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 the immune and the tumor cells don't quite match. And so, so that making the results very hard to interpret. In the, in, you know, people also try to do humanized immune model where they right, try to, uh, you know, kind of humanize the mouse with the immune system that puts in patient tumor cells. First, they are very complex, they're very expensive. But also second is still, uh, it doesn't recapitulate the tumor, uh, the, the environment because the, the, the environment actually is the mouse environment, right? So, so, the, so, the, so here what we showed is right, when we generate the mouse, because we are packing all these tumor and the stromal cells in this small volume uh, very quickly, right? Right out of the patient's uh, body. And, uh, and we are, are, we, you know, are we able to create a niche that really be helpful to sustain uh, that the tumor microenvironment, not just the tumor cells. And here we did a single cell uh, profiling and compared the original tumor tissue with the, the tumor moss. And you can appreciate that, right? That this is by day 12 and the moss still sustains the, all the major cell types, including the tumor cells showing in magenta, but also lymphoid, lymph, uh, lymphoid, lymph, uh, lymphocytes, including T cells and B cells showing green and the myeloid cells such as macrophages dendritic cells and natural cells. Um, and last is you know, the fibroblast um, um, in, the, in the tumor. And also if you do further go down, you actually can see right, a much higher resolution on the sub-cell types, even also like uh, endothelial cells and various different kinds of new cells. So, so this is really providing a, a technology that allows to recapitulate the tumor immune environment from the patients. And furthermore, we wanna say, look, does the tumor cell still we capitulate the tumor uh, microenvironment. So here you can see the PDL1, right, as known, the checkpoint inhibitor ligand that 
that kind of blocked the T cells from attacking and really, uh, you know, was the all the you know gave rise to the checkpoint inhibitor uh, therapies. That's is the, the the dominant form of immunotherapy. So the PDL1 in this case, you can see both in moss and tissue express uh, not only just in tumor cells, but also in the myeloid cells that include the macrophage dendritic cell and very high, right? So in this case, in this patient, this is a lung cancer patient. In this case, the macrophages and dendritic cells are expressing high PDL1 and blocking T cells from attacking the tumor. So you can imagine that when you do this uh, passaging models, and, and eventually, right, while you get a, get a, get a, get a, uh, um, a long passage, the organoids of patient derived xenograft, you would have lost this population. So you'll lose that biology, right? So in your model, you will say, oh, the drug works great. Then you put in the patient and it doesn't work because you're not addressing uh, these population that's responsible for creating tumor suppressive in my environment. But then if you look at PD-1, right, that's expressing T cell, TJ beta, also very well known. Um, a molecule that create a tumor suppressive environment. Um, again, right, the, 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 the MOS really recapitulate the same path. And furthermore, what the MOS allows you to do is because of the size is about 250 microns in, in diameter, which is within the natural diffusion limit. What this allows us to do is actually do very easy antibody staining, both in live MOS, you don't have to you know, uh, fix them, uh, but also you can, you can fix them and do immunofluorescence or or do you know IHC immunohistochemistry? But anyway, what it provides is a way for us to look at what's inside these moss. In this case, again, you can see right that 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 P stains for the nuclei, pan C can up can uh, stain for the tumor cells. But you know CD3 lymphocytes are very much present in these moss, and we can follow with a flow cytometry to look at all the different cell population that are still present there. We can look at the T cell. You know, activation and exhaustion marker, right? In this case, uh, look at whether what's the state of those T cells, and even also look at a different cell population, right? This is an example of live incubation. These moths are still alive, the tumor cells to grow. We can do longitudinal tracking of the different cell population inside the moths and see how they respond to the treatment. In this case, the dendritic cells are still very much present in these moths by day um, 11. Again, so, so showing that the inside this tumor, there's still priming capability, right? There's still antigen presenting, uh, presentation capability inside this mouse. And furthermore, if we can actually grow this mouse, not just from fresh tissue, but also from frozen tissue, we can free this uh, tissue um, viably, we can actually recover them and, and really still be able to grow mouse very robustly. Again, with the original tumor immune environment, you can see all the different immune subtypes are still very much present inside the moss. And we did this with uh, many different cancer types, right? In this case, kidney, colon, hand, neck, and lung. Again, again, we can show that the magic of this moss, right, by packing the cells very quickly uh, inside this uh, small volume, allow them to reestablish the original niche or ecosystem um, uh, in, from the original tumor. And what the moss also providing is while you miniaturize something, right, you are increasing the surface to volume ratio and kind of mimicking the natural right, the plasma diffusion inside those tissue and all that combined really creating uh, you know, kind of a very um, uh, 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 amazing technology that allows to keep the tumor microenvironment, especially immune cells. And furthermore, because the tumor cells are still present inside these moths and presenting the antigen, but that allows the, right, the, the, the moths to, to still keep our, um, the, the original uh, T cell TCR uh, uh, clonal uh, abundance. So you can see here that compared to the tissue showing blue or the red in the moss, if you look at it, if we do a, a, T, a TCR, right, T cell receptor sequencing, you can see that the relative uh, abundance of the different T cell clones are very well preserved inside these moss. Rather than if you just call, try to culture those T cells, you will see that the clone change a lot and you tend to lose this most relevant tumor antigen recognizing clones because they are, you know, they, they are still within that ecosystem uh, with, with exposure to these tumor antigens. And furthermore, this technology can also really recapitulate a lot of the biology. For example, right, um, in this case, from the same patient tumor, when we do the, the, this imaging, right, so I'll show you these different markers. Again, red is the right, CD3, um, the, 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 uh, the, the, the lymphocytes and, and especially the T cells. 
So you can see, right, from the same patient, certain region inside the mosque, the T cells are penetrated pretty well in, into the mosque, but in some other region, the T cells are actually more in the peripheral, but have problem penetrating and creating this kind of immune exclusion phenotype, which we can see clinically in the patient tumor, where the fibroblast right outside the tumor is kind of blocking the T cell from, uh, from entering. So we are really be able to capture um, uh, a lot of this biology and, and really be able to understand why the patient tumor can respond or not, which is right now, there's no other way to assess. So in this case, this, so this allows to do this kind of IO assay. In this case, it's a, a, a lung cancer patient where the tumor spheres grow very aggressively inside the mouse in the original tumor microenvironment. Here, we didn't add any cells. We also didn't add any cytokines. Um, uh, the, uh, the tumor spheres, you can see the microenvironment cannot contain the growth of the tumor. However, when we added a checkpoint inhibitor, you can see the T cell got activated, a green cell death signal, a nexin. You can see that the, the T cells are wiped out, right, the, these tumor spheres. And this can take as a few as one single T cell. If a single T cell recognizes the moss, it, it can actually go around and really attack the tumor. And this technology really allow, allows you to kind of recapture these kind of uh, dyna dynamics. And furthermore, another right, kind of important application for these technologies for cell therapy establishing adopted cell therapy. These are like when we extract the patient's you know, T cells from their blood or from their tumor, we expand them, we might even engineer them. And after let's say two months, we put the patient, we put the T cell back to the patient to treat the patient. And, uh, and the, the challenge is right after two months, how do we know? Are, you, are we expanding the right T cells? Are they exhausted? Will they actually work in the patient, right? In the clinic, there's a huge variation and really kind of, you know, basically prompt the FDA to require some kind of potency assay as a low release assay to assess whether the T cell uh, really would work on the patient, uh, will, will, will have a, high, uh, a decent chance of success. So in this case, right, we provide a very first assay of this sort where these are the patient tumors and the green labeled uh, uh, TILs are tumor infiltrating lymphocytes that have been outside the patient body expanded for two months by our partner and putting, before putting back to the patient, you know, doing this assay to say, look, do these T cells still work? In this case, you can see that these T cells are penetrating the, the moss, start you know, attacking the tumor and really burst open the extracellular matrix, right? When, they, when they're attacking the tumor and the, the remodeling is very, uh, ECM remodeling is very prominent. Now, if we're just using an HLA blocker to block the antigen presentation on this tumor cell, right? We're not changing anything else, just, just uh, shielding the antigen um, from the tumor cells. In this case, you can, case you can see the T cells still kind of aggregate, aggregate around the moss, right? I, the open space, they are much slower at the penetrating and certainly not attacking the tumor as much uh, as, uh, as often. So this kind of show that, right, the fact is really antigen uh, specific and, and these tails are, you know, kind of really be able to recognize um, um, the antigen and kill them. So, so this is kind of a success, uh, successful product that we should put, put, be put into the patient. And furthermore, what this technology allows us to also assess, right, kind of whether, whether, the, whether we can do further combinations. So in this case, right, again, as I showed before, the tumor, our mouse really recapitulate, right, that all the different uh, cells inside the tumor microenvironment. Now the question is, okay, if I add, right, let's say a checkpoint inhibitor with the cell therapy, would I, would I be able to enhance the treatment? And those are very clinical challenges to try because again, cell therapy is already a very right, um, involving process that, you know, kind of, um, you know, it's not the easiest to recruit patients and it's have a tremendous cost. Now, if you are adding another combo, now you're talking about, right, with the randomized arm and that just the, the, it becoming very quickly becoming uh, like a very challenging or impossible to do such trial. You say you don't have the patient number, but here we can provide patient avatar to do this quickly. And this patient can see when we add in the tills, if the T cells have killing, but then they become exhausted. So the killing you know, kind of goes down. Um, if we add in this case, patient, when we add an anti-PD-1, it make the, making the effect much more durable. And if we're adding an MHC blocker, we actually block the energy presentation then aggregate that effect. And furthermore, besides the tumor, we can measure the cytokine also in a very precise fashion. And in this case, again, right, adding tails, we, have, we see both intracellularly and secreted form, there's an elevated level of interferon gamma, and if you block if 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 you block the energy presentation, you aggregate that. If we had a PD one plus the T the, the tails, uh, we have a, we'll get a much higher activation of these T cells. 
And furthermore, what this technology allows to do is also be able to track individual T cells and uh, you know, kind of assessing their kinetics. Uh, in this case, um, you can see that if you block the antigen presentation, the T cells still go around the moss as shown by these green kind of you know, uh, um, areas, but then yeah, they have a much harder time penetrating inside the, in, into the moss uh, without the antigen. So, so this is also very important for cell therapy treatment, right? If the cell therapy is not working, is it because they are not going to the tumor? Is it because they are not penetrating the tumor? Is it because they are not recognizing the tumor antigen and not killing the tumor? So these kind of analysis will be, you know, allow us to delineate the different effects. So here, you know, first on technology level, right? I showed you this microorganosphere MOS technology, where and they really have some advantages. First, is in the clinic to to potentially guide the patient therapy. It can be done very fast within ten days, and dealing with very small tissue, uh, thanks to its miniaturization. Uh, second is it has much higher through potentially much higher throughput, and third is it is uh, recapitulate the tumor microenvironment. So here, what we really trying to do, right, using this technology. To, to improve patient survival by both helping clinician pick the right treatment in the clinic to treat the patient, but also try to help accelerate the drug discovery. In the clinic, right, this is kind of really the setting of our clinical trials, where we take an 18 gauge biopsy from the patient, encapsulate the tumor cells along with these immune cells, uh, the, the stromal cells, and allow the tumor to form tumor spheres in a very short amount of time. And then we can, you know, we get tens of thousands of these. Uh, patient tumor avatars that we can, you know, dispense them accurately in, you know, high density wall plates and assess their response to drugs, uh, picking picking the most effective if effective drug, and within ten days and use it back on the patient. And this is again published in the South Stem Cell paper. We started doing this assay. And on the right is really the, like the very first adequate cancer patient from that trial. And for the four, four MOS that were uh, patient-derived MOS that were uh, sen resist uh, sensitive to the treatment, all four of the patients stayed past treatment past 25 weeks, right? Um, one patient switched treatment, uh, the tumor potentially acquired resistance. So uh, the patient switched treatment, another three I just stayed uh, kind of, you know, uh, more long-term. Now for the, Four, four patients that the mouse were resistant, three of them were taken off treatment within 10 weeks, basically the first uh, CT scan and the doctor decided the tumor kept pro progressing. One patient had a mixed response. Some of the lesions progressed, some of the lesion um, actually um, you know, was stable, but by the week 28, the, the, the uh, clinician actually decided to do a liver resection and they just cut off that tumor. So that's why they didn't decide, they didn't bother to uh, switch to new treatment. And uh, if you look compared to other cancer type, it has a very similar message. So first is this is actually a trial has started last month. It's a registered trial with uh, 12 participating participating sites managed by CRO. Again, the idea is you know getting the drug uh, uh, to derive the patient mouse and do the drug treatment within 14 days. And you know, MD Anderson is leading the US trial. Um, but also other sites, including International Valve Bra, which is like the big hospital in Barcelona, which is part of the six uh, uh, Europe Cancer Core, is also participating in such trial. Um, and second is on the on the pharmaceutical side, um, we can also right really using this, this technology to help the farmers. Why? Because right, we often heard about how the drugs were expensive; they are taking many years to develop. Because right, you know, uh, every time a farmer take a drug to a clinic. Clinic, they're taking a tremendous risk, right? Uh, more than more than 95% of drug oncology drugs fail in clinical trials, and also on average take right four years, six hundred million dollars for such failures. If we have a technology that actually can predict patients' drug response without having to put a drug into the patients, that could really, you know, de-risk the trial a lot, save a lot of money and time, but also really saving a precious clinical uh, patients' time, right? By avoiding putting them on the on the on the ineffective drug, uh, drug. so again, our technology providing uh, both on the throughput end, providing the, the very first end-to-end -end patient drug model pipeline for high throughput drug screening, right? Ultra high throughput drug screening, but then also allows us to help you know kind of further refine this drug treatment for clinical development. On the high throughput, right? Again, what I mentioned is that 
automation and standardization is key because if you're thinking about a, a, a platform that really you know, is gonna enable high throughput drug screening, it has to be automated. So here, right, this you know, what MOS enables is this high, you know, this really high throughput uh, system, robotic system that you know the auto task you can schedule on the software so people don't have to fight for the for the, uh, for the scope, right? The all the all the patient uh, mouse models belt, uh, banks are managed by barcoding that uh, we can be automatically you know managed and take out for the right um, um, uh, drug dosing. And what MOS enables again this very high precise and fast by right, dispensing of MOS because you can simply pat patting them, not like traditional uh, or, you know organoids that you have to do you know deal with bulk major gel, you have to you know do temperature melting them and all that stuff, right? So this is becoming very easy and very accurate, uh, fully compatible with, you know, current, you know, also, you know, uh, a robotic system. And furthermore, even the imaging can be uh, uh, automated so that, uh, and, and all the um, uh, images are automatically acquired for the throughput. So, so this is kind of one right example of what we did. So here we look at a thousand past corridor cancer clinical trials and, and, and pick the 219 drugs that most of them failed the clinical trial, but some of them succeeded and, and did this study, right? Derive the colon, colon cancer patient avatars, MOS avatars, and say, look, I test each drug, right? Put, put 219 drugs on each patient avatars and see what happens, right? This is something you cannot do in the clinic. You can only give a, a patient one drug. So you cannot do such comparison, right? So again, this entire study Right, was finished within nine days, generating 50 terabytes of data. And, and you can see from every patient, you'll get this kind of right, time dose, a uh, time, uh, time series response. You can look at how the tumor responds to the, to the drug. You know, some drug doesn't do much, some drug is more effective. And furthermore, right, you can appreciate if you look at an individual, a different patient respond to the same drug, right? Different patient has a very different drug response uh, profile. And for some of the patients that we have clinical outcome, when we end up finding one, we just cluster them, they actually correlate very well with the patient's clinical uh, uh, data uh, outcome, in, in, including the, uh, uh, the, the, the first three months response time, but also progression free survival. And, but what's the most powerful thing is, right? When we did a study, we just look at the overall heat map. This, you can almost predict why, what drugs fail the clinical trial, right? You can see the majority of the drug has relatively, you know, uh, 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 low response rate, right? The brightest basically means the tumor is not killing, darkest means the, 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 the killing. And also, right, some of the drugs actually, you know, are much more effective. They tend to be, you know, end up approved drug. Some drugs kills everything, they are way too toxic. So again, just imagine that the time and the effort spent on thousand clinical trials that we complete this in nine days. And furthermore, we can further identify interesting drugs, right? There are certain drugs that um, you know, even though overall they have lower response rate than the frontline uh, treatment, but sometimes they actually have a more effective against the resistant uh, uh, tumors that, you know, if we know how to pick those patients, actually, right, so a lot of those drugs will bring a lot of value, um, even though they're not like first line, second line, line uh, treatment that as people try to do, uh, do the trial. And also, uh, you know, so that's kind of for high through screening, but this is a second example where with our partners, they have a specific, by specific antibody where to you know, bring CD3 positive T cells to attack the tumor cells. And by, by that time, right, like they, you, know, you work on cell lines, there's some uh, evidence, but it's, you know, it, it's kind of not clear whether the drugs will work on patients. Again, uh, in three months, we did um, you know, 43 patients and showed that eight of them uh, clearly showed a response to this treatment. And, and, and actually by June, the INDs filed, right? And, and, and the partner is pushing the drug to a clinical trial. But they also came back and said, look, there are another seven patients that completely meet our criteria. Why are they not responding? Right? For some of them, we actually show the reason is because they downread regularly their HLA, so they're not presenting their antigen, so, so, the, so the T cells are not recognizing them. Now, this technology also allows to explore combinations that potentially boost uh, the HLA presentation so that prevent those cheaters. We also show that if you just express HLA A2 of the tumor, the pay those patients responded right away. And furthermore, we explored a second um, drug that actually target the tumor microenvironment, not the tumor cells, but the fibroblast. So here you can see that each drug alone 
doesn't, doesn't do much right, to the treatment compared to negative control, but then combining them has a very synergistic effect compared to the positive control. So again, right, these are, um, are kind of the combinations that otherwise there's no way you could, right, you could test them. And last is, again, the trial started in both Europe and the US uh, last December. And what this technology also showed is that how the patient is gonna respond, right? It's not just a simply binary respond or not respond. In the left, you can see that patient complete had a complete, you know, would have a, would have a complete response. All the tumor uh, spheres are getting killed, the turning orange. On the right is a patient are completely resistant. Uh, all the tumor sphere was, remain green. In the middle are many cases, right, where you have this mosaic pattern where you would anticipate that, you know, the patient would have a partial response, but the tumor is gonna grow back. So last is, right, so we are actually, you know, kind of uh, collaborating with, you know, top leading, you know, cancer institute and really thinking about uh, this uh, vision, right, using this technology to uh, transform the next generation position, uh, medicine or position oncology, where the patient take a mouse and we'll do our assay to determine whether the patient, which standard of care the patient should go, uh, go through. And when a patient become resistant to the standard of care, this trial, uh, uh, this technology can guide them to the right clinical trials uh, with the right agent that might have a much higher uh, success rate than, uh, uh, than, the, uh, uh, than the current kind of more random approach. And furthermore, this also providing right, that these patient avatars, as I showed you, right, for, for new drug development that further can benefit those patients. So overall, we think, you know, kind of we are thinking about precision oncology or precision medicine, right? I, I think now in the last 10 or 20 years, a lot of most efforts focus on genomic sequencing and also patient data. I think, but for the next generation precision oncology, there's a missing pillar, which is the therapeutic profiling, uh, where you need a functional data, right? I should understand how the cell responds to the drug to really complement the first two approach to have a much more accurate way of predicting patient response, cover that 90% patient that currently the genomics alone is not sufficient to predict the drug response. And the goal is again, by combining the, uh, the MOS, uh, allow us to kind of really like combining integrated different data um, and doing kind of hypothesis testing and combine it with more sophisticated algorithm. We hope one day that we, have, we can have a much more predictive model to help patients both in the clinic, but also helping uh, kind of in the drug development uh, in the clinic. Uh, so, so with that, I want to thank a lot of my lab members and, uh, and uh, you know, um, my collaborators and funding agencies, and I'm open to questions. Thanks. Thank you for the fantastic talk, uh, Professor Shen. Uh, many questions came in. So let me see. One question is about the, um, about the organoids. It says cells grow uh, over time within these uh, uh, MOS systems, but then if you, they grow too much, do they break the coating or what happens after you reach the maximum size of coating? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Yes, well, if they keep growing, um, absolutely they will. So what we can do is several, diff uh, several approaches. Uh, first is that we can actually simply, uh, depend on gel, we can simply melt the gel and regenerate moss again. Um, right, with uh, basically with more mass. So, so with the increased mass, we actually can generate more. So essentially just passaging these uh, microorganospheres. Um, and the second also is what we notice is if, you use, if we use synthetic gel uh, from the hydrogel rather than major gel, the, the hydrogels are much more, much more stable because as you said, that the, the cells might eat up the uh, protein the major gel. So with hydrogel, um, um, it can last longer uh, uh, for this, um, uh, for this um, uh, moss. So, so yes, so we can either passage them, we can also put out synthetic gel to culture them longer, but essentially you can passage them again. So uh, yes. Thank you. Um, can this technology kept, um, handle a wide range of cells or are there any limits? Yes, so yeah, exactly the, the um, this technology actually, pretty much covers all solid tumors. Uh, I, I didn't show the slide, but it, it actually pretty much all solid tumors. And also, again, this technology is not tumor specific. It actually, right, you can, as you can imagine, um, um, we actually use it to model a lot of the normal tissues too. So, so pretty much all solid tissue models can, and also as a short example, 
what we are uh, discovering is is also for some a lot of the blood cells, cancer, or some normal cells that require the bondage. This technology also works actually a lot better uh, for those um, cell types as well. And also another advantage is we can maintain the heterogeneity inside the tissue, right? Uh, uh, stromal cells, immune cells, and, and the tumor cells, epithelial cells. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, MOS is a relatively large particle, is interesting potential to aggregate and cluster. Uh, how do you get around this problem? Can, can we, can, sorry, so, so you said- Yeah, do these particles, yeah, come together and cluster together and how do you solve it? Yeah, so um, depends on how we, so, so uh, two things, right? So these are, these are cells sitting in these, you know, kind of moss, micro, you know, moss, micro gel. So first is the, so it's, so, so the gels, so the balls, the moss don't actively, right, kind of, aggregate or seek out each other because the cells inside the moss well, but each, each particle is a separate particle. Now, during the, but you're absolutely right. You also just see that um, during the culturing first, you know, uh, they can move around a little bit, uh, but they mostly sit on the bottom of the plate. But second is if you play them very densely, we do see this emerging. I think the cells like to get, get, get with each other. We actually definitely see that. We also see, right, these are gels, by the way, also porous. Right, so, so, so what happens, the cell can crawl inside out. We certainly can see T cells move from one gel to the other, or fibroblasts go out of the gel and go to the bottom if, you know, if, um, um, if we don't have a non-attachment uh, plate. So with all that said, sometimes they can uh, get together. So there's a couple of things. You, using certain TC culture plate, we actually can keep the moss kind of a little more fixated on the bottom so they cannot move around. So that can be that can be easily done. Second is we also have micro well plates. These are plates that have about 400 micron uh, wells in diameter that each moss sitting there and cannot just you know kind of uh, move around. So so if we if fix if if kind of fixating the moss uh, is of importance, we actually certainly have technology to do that. But most time you don't quite require like you know the uh, the moss are kind of sitting on the bottom and they don't move that much. Okay, thank you. How are T cells attracted to the MOS by chemokines or adhesion molecule dependent mechanism? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, again, we haven't really done like you know very you know careful mechanistic study. We certainly observe the T cell get attracted to the to the moss, right? Even in the case when I show that we block the HLA blocker, the T cell will still go to the moss, right? And and so there's certainly something attracting them. And I think it's a cytokines that the tumor cells secreting. And we certainly know they do, because as I said, you know, in, some, in this culture condition, we are not adding any cytokines right, inside, the, inside the culture. But if you measure them, you will get cytokines. So you know, T, you know all the cells are secreting cytokines. So it's a kind of a ecosystem where this, all the cells are signaling and talking to each, each other, right? Like a birds in a way. Um, so so there's certainly, but adhesion molecule, things like that are certainly possible too. So um, you're right. I think that the cells are secreting factors to uh, attracting this TC. Thank you. What is the timeline for generating an MOS and get the first degree of results? Yeah. So the timeline is when we get in a biopsy or from frozen samples, it takes about, you know, if a solid tumor, you're gonna, right, you're gonna digest them. And it takes about like a half an hour to, uh, to generate uh, this moss. Uh, or, or an hour, it depends on some, it's sometimes the cancer type uh, dependent. Uh, but then, of course, you can do them in parallel, right? That machine is not one at a time, you can do four at four a time, and you can keep flowing them. So, so the, the, but then, like, you know, um, usually we would wait for a couple of days to, to, to see that they, the tumor spheres are clearly established, right? These tumor cells are proliferating and, and forming the structures. Um, so we waited about two to, two to five days for these to uh, establish, then we're going to do the drug dose uh, on this uh, sphere. So usually finish in around 10 days. Um, yeah. Thanks. Great talk. Have you done or are you planning to do multi-omic studies using MOS to understand disease mechanism and or predict therapy responses based on combination of multiple omics data? Yeah, that's a great question. I, uh, obviously, I think well, with some of the farmers, that we are we are doing that, which is right. We also even did a lot of single cell right um, study here. I didn't. I just show you the sing, one single cell plot showing the different cell type. But we actually did a lot of differential gene expression analysis. 
look at it in each cell types, how the, how the gene expression change and how that you know, change in response to drug treatment. So, uh, so certainly we are doing this kind of study and the mouse provide a very good system for us to, um, um, to understand uh, the mechanisms. Thank you. How long do, do the immune cells stay viable? Do you add some special supplements? Yeah, that's a uh, fantastic uh, question. And what we see is that um, uh, first, you know, I showed right some of the flow and everything that up to uh, 21 days, these immune cells are still present. Um, now, the, uh, um, the, um, we, we, there's several things we could do. Um, one is, as I said, right, the data I showed you does not contain any cytokines. So but now if you imagine you have this moss, right, sitting in the media, so compared to, our, compared to tissue, actually the, the cytokines getting diluted, right? Because one thing I think about in, our, in, 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 in the human body, these tissues, what they really having access is basically plasma, right, diffused from the blood, and that's it, right? They don't require all the extra cytokines to maintain themselves. But however, in our system right now, it still, it gets diluted a little bit in the, in the, in the well by the media and everything, media change everything. So, you know, if we add in some cytokines, we can even keep them, you know, um, present a lot longer, right? But then there's always a trade-off, which is we had to add a physiologically relevant amount to our form for like L2, right? We will add a very little, like a 50 units so that it does not actually become an artifact. Okay, thank you. If the T cells are not expressing pd one or pd one receptors, is there another receptor that we can target for cancer therapy? That's actually a great question too. And in our system, right, we actually could see, again, I did not, I did not show the, um, did not show the data. I actually took a couple in the last minute, but that's exactly what we are doing, which is, you know, with some partners, right, which is everyone look at the PD-1 checkpoint inhibitors, everything, right, and all the immune therapies. I think the core questions, are there different axes? And clearly, right, there are, there's the anti-tidget, TIM3, the LAGIT. But however, I think one, one, one important also challenge what people are facing is that often seems to, we, we, we are not finding a second checkpoint inhibitor is a dominant as PD-1, right, pd one so, so now we are looking at checkpoint and that might work for 10 or 15% of the patient, or they might work, have to work in the combinations, right? And, but then how to pick the right combination, how to pick the right patients become the most challenging for all the new kind of immune drugs, especially checkpoint pointers. And we actually, you know, show that what MOS really allows you to explore is that, right, hey, like you have a drug that might work on some patients, not gonna work as well as PD-1 blockade in terms of overall response rate, right? But you can actually target patient who, exactly as you said, have low expression of pd one but not gonna respond to the PD-1 blockade. And, and if you show your drug actually work on that, those patients, that create a tremendous value. Or if you combine with PD-1 blockade, you, now you're targeting a bigger population, right? That could also be clinically very important. So that's exactly what this technology enables you to do. And right now it's very difficult to do in the clinic. Thank you so much. One final question is, how do you make the organoids from single cells after cell sorting or heterogeneous cells after tissue isolation? Yeah, that's a great question. And again, first I want to clarify that uh, to, the moss is not organoids. You know, I don't want to get into too strict and for people, you know, talk about definition. Organoids often, the strict definition is often requires several, right, several passages, um, um, several kind of uh, passages that allow the stem cell to self renew while the other cells, different cells kind of, you know, Kind of, kind of go away, the original differential to go away. So strictly speaking, this is, that's why I call a moss and it's an ex vivo, right? Uh, ex vivo uh, culture that allowed the tumor spheres to uh, form. But anyway, the, the, uh, the, 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 qu the question about, oh, sorry, actually, I, I forgot a question a little bit. I saw it's about digression. What, what a question again? Question was uh, single cells versus hetero, you know, yeah, yeah. heterogeneous cells. How do you make yeah, perfect, arguments? yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so for that, that's a great question. And actually we do both, depends on the application. If we want to do, right, clinically assess the drug tumor response to the drug, and we, you know, if you think about in the clinic, right, you give a treatment, what you can assess is, oh, I gave a treatment, I'll do a CT scan or PET scan, PET, uh, PET, 
to look at right how much the tumor shrink. So if uh, you know if we try to assess the tumor response, what we do is we um, kind of you know break that down, down to more single cell levels. While we remix them to the mouse, we have a more homogeneous uh, mouse population. Now, if we are interested in heterogeneity in terms of what's the original, again, I'm not showing the slide. We also have techniques that rather than go down to individual cell, we're actually gonna grow little tissue chunks inside those mouse that preserve the original tumor, uh, tumor microenvironment, the ECM, and original structure and the heterogeneity. And there you will see great heterogeneity, exactly as you will see in the patient tumor, where you have regions that are heavily penetrated by new and regions that sometimes get void. And, and, and that kind of exactly give you um, the, the kind of the, the, the ability to understand right, kind of the intertumoral hydrogenate. Well, that's all the questions I have. Thank you for your time okay. for this great talk. All right, thanks everyone. And thank have you for nice attending. Day.